Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sherry, uh, for your introduction. I'd also like to acknowledge the indigenous people on whose territory we have the uh, honor to stand on today. And I'd also like to thank you as, uh, I guess, people who come to listen to, uh, I guess, uh, a very new area of, of thinking in terms of uh, indigenous rights and how that's going to unfold here in in Canada over the next uh, decade or so. I think it's, it's really important to, to try and understand this very, very, very complicated problem. I, I, I'd like to start by just saying that uh, Canada is, uh, what is this, the second largest country in the world. I think it's important to start with that. And I think it's also important to state that Canada has a population of uh, 36 million people, one million of them being indigenous. I think it's also important, because I'm from British Columbia, it's also important to say that British Columbia as a territory is the same size as California, Oregon, and Washington State combined with a population of only 4.5 million people, 200,000 of them being indigenous. In the greater Toronto area, the population is a little over 5 million people. So there's more people in this area than all of British Columbia. And one of the fundamental problems we have here in Canada, being the second largest country in the world with a tiny population of 36 million people, is the uh, land question in relationship to indigenous people. I think it's important to understand that uh, <clears throat> colonization in, in, in Canada is a real tragic uh, consequence in the history of indigenous people in this country. Uh, systematic <laughs> impoverishment is what my people have suffered from since 1867, since the British North America Act was passed in Britain and Canada's first constitution where they divided up all the land in Canada between Section 91 federal law or jurisdiction or Section 92 a provincial crown jurisdiction. Because when you add up all the Indian reserves in this country, I don't know if you know this, our land base is 0.2% of Canada, 0.2. That has resulted in the United Nations Human Development Index when it's applied to the statistics of my people living on Indian reserves. You know, we're about around level 74 and Canada is up in level five or one, one to five. That's a big difference between a federal provincial system that controls 99.8% of the territory and a people who land resource base is 0 0.2. See, that's the big, the big question facing Canadians. Is a big question facing indigenous people. And, the, and we went to court over this matter, and we've been very successful uh, before courts with good lawyers, Louise Mandel and, and other people that were educated in law schools like this. We're able to argue the points that this is indigenous people depended on this land and resource base 
the hunting and fishing culture, and we still have proprietary rights, Aboriginal title in that land. We study these cases here in, in, in this law school. And we've been successful in winning those cases and uh, changing things. Uh, but we've always had a problem with um, having that apply on the ground. It's always been, been a problem. Because um, the example I, I, I use is uh, in terms of this battle that we have between the judicial system on the one hand and the executive branch on the other hand, which is the prime minister and cabinet on the other end, is they don't agree on this question of, of Aboriginal title. You know, the Supreme Court of Canada recognizes it. It does exist. And what the government should do in those circumstances is it should set up a policy where how do we apply the fact that Indigenous people have Aboriginal title on the ground. It's the same thing as other laws when the Supreme Court of Canada finds that legally a certain proprietary interest does exist and the government should come along with some process of trying to apply that to the existing legislation and laws that they have. But when it comes to Aboriginal title, they don't do that. And that's a problem where, where, where we have a situation because the government does not want to recognize the uh, the land rights in the ground. And I'll come back to that. The other part of Canadian colonialism, in addition to the dispossession, is the question of dependency. You know, it's, it's when I say, can I say I'm a Canadian? When we don't enjoy the same um, rights as other Canadians when we're on an Indian reserve, for instance. You know what I mean? When you're on an Indian reserve, you don't receive any provincial services because you're on a federal Indian reserve. Therefore, let's say for instance, they wanna have bus service on the Camelot Indian Reserve. They don't have bus service on the Indian Reserve and they have to go into a whole big negotiation process with the province and with the municipality to get bus service on the Indian Reserve. So people living in this one suburb little community there called Thompson Rivers University can catch the bus and go to Thompson Rivers University across the river. It's a whole big negotiating process. They have to pay over a quarter of a million dollars to get the, some service over there. I know in the BC uh, Treaty Agreement at Tawasin, their big uh, thing that they said was a grand spectacular was that they're gonna get bus service so that they'd be hooked into the Vancouver transit system. So they, they don't get the same service. So how can you even say you're Canadian when half of the services that are offered to provincial uh, people aren't offered to your children in your own community? And how can you say you're from British Columbia when you don't receive over all the services from the province of British Columbia or here in Ontario, the same difference doesn't matter. So even though white people can say, well, you're, you should be proud to be Canadian, you're not Canadian because there are certain things that you don't have that other people take for granted like bus services and stuff like that, that other things that people consider as, as whole. And when we want to negotiate it, it becomes a whole damn problem of negotiating powers between section 91, 92, and how does it affect us as indigenous people? See, I was a, a, a 0 0.2 chief for eight years. I call it a 0 0.2, because that was my land base. And I couldn't address the poverty of my people. 
because when I sit across the table from the ministry force people from the province under section 92, they'd say, hey, sorry, chief, all the timber's been allocated to warehouse or tolco and all of the logging companies, and we'd have actually nothing left there. Same thing with mining companies. Same thing with hydro, all the stuff. It's all been dealt with. Your, your power base, your land base is 0 0.2. Get used to it. And that's how come the social welfare system is so high on Indian reserves. And uh, dependency is, is, you know, when you steal somebody's land, you take 99.8% and you give them 0.2%, then you're responsible for taking care of the people living on that 0.2 forever. Basically, it's just like putting somebody in jail. When you put them in jail, you have to feed them. You have to take care of them. And that's what the, the, the Indian reservation system is really, is, is like an incarceration camp where you have to take care of us. And a lot of people complain about us being the bottomless pit in the government where money goes and Nothing beneficial happens. But nothing will ever happen if you continue to live on 0.2% of the land base. It's not going to change. You can do all kinds of trickery and all kinds of massaging of the 0.2 programs and services, but nothing will really change. See, that's the, the other aspect of colonization. Dispossession, you know, creates dependency. And then when the native people fight back, like they did at Elsie Book too, or they did at uh, Oka, or they did at Gossipson Lake, or they do, they will be doing at Kinder Morgan shortly, uh, you're gonna wind up with oppression. You're gonna wind up with the, everything from the army to the RCMP, the OPP, the Sarte Quebec, or whatever have you, oppressing the people. See, that, that, that's what really opens up the question of human rights. And Canadians need to understand that. That, you know, what is normal in relationship to indigenous people and settler Canadians. The real normal factor is that the indigenous people are poor, they're going to continue to be poor, and they will always be poor. And that's just normally how settlement in Canada has created. And that's what the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples report, if you read it, that's what they do. They do a historical analysis of how the 91, 92 powers have totally uh, dehumanized the relationship between uh, settler Canada and indigenous people. And um, that's what we're struggling with. Struggling with in, 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 in the courts is how do you deal with it? And that's what we're talking about here in terms of uh, attributing some economic value to the macroeconomic rights of indigenous people. You know, because when the Supreme Court of Canada recognized that Aboriginal title does exist, they generated a proprietary interest for indigenous people, but how does that unfold on the ground? When the, Supreme, when the Canadian Constitution was uh, patriated in 1982 and Section 35.1 was added to the uh, Canadian Constitution, what does that mean in contemporary terms? And the way I look at it, I look at it as that there's really basically three orders of, of government now. You know, when we started off in 1867, there was really just two orders of government, the federal and provincial government under 91, 92. And that was a really 100% British colonial uh, theft 
of our traditional territories, indigenous people. And uh, <clears throat> I remember the former uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, Pierre Trudeau, when he was the Prime Minister, he wrote a paper in 1969, him and Jean Chrétien, called the 1969 White Paper Policy. And it was that policy that they wanted to uh, terminate Indigenous people constitutionally and legally and assimilate us into the uh, Canadian uh, mainstream society. That's what the white paper policy was about. So when uh, and my dad uh, actually uh, challenged that, and that's when he got into the National Union Brotherhood and stuff like that, and, and fought against that policy, along with Harold Cardinal and a whole bunch of Indigenous leaders from that period struggled and stopped it at that point in time as, the, as being an official direction Canada was going to go into. And then when it came time when Trudeau wanted to patriate the Canadian Constitution, bring the British North America Act of 1867 to Canada and make it a Canadian Constitution, my dad got nervous about that and decided to engage in the Constitution Express, which was a train from Vancouver to Ottawa uh, where they were going to raise the whole question of they didn't want the Canadian uh, Constitution patriated until the BC land question was dealt with. That's what their position was. They came across, they got a lot of support nationally, and then the next year, 1981, they started lobbying the House of Lords in uh, England. They actually went to court in England. They actually lobbied the House of Commons. And they got a lot of support amongst the members of Parliament and the House of Lords. They got so much support that the Prime Minister back then told Trudeau that he wasn't really sure about this free vote in terms of the Canadian Constitution unless the Canadian government agreed to put Aboriginal rights in the Constitution. And that's how Section 35.1 got in the Constitution. Because it was a 180 degree turn for Pierre Trudeau from 69 to 35.1. That's a, one, it's a total reversal of his position, you know? And it's Christian too, but they had to do it in order to have Britain say, okay, we'll let you go, but you need to agree to recognize uh, those rights. And once they did that, the courts and, uh, recognized generally that, and the government itself and their policy recognized that uh, hunting and fishing are part of those Aboriginal rights. The other thing that's part of them is Aboriginal title, because that's what Delgamuk said, that Aboriginal title is an Aboriginal right. And the other thing that's recognized is Aboriginal uh, um, the title and the government, self-government is part of that. It's part of that Aboriginal right. And it's important to understand that if Indigenous people can establish Aboriginal title, the white courts also have to recognize Indigenous law. Because if I recognize that you have the right to your land, I also have to recognize that you have the right to make law in regard to your land, because those things are hand in glove in that way. So that's also recognized that indigenous law comes along with that. So that's what we're trying to define here, is what does that really mean? How do we use this title and rights business to start adjusting the economic machinery within this country so that indigenous people can benefit from resources in their territory. Something that we were always marginalized under the old system. How do we change that so that indigenous people are included in, in, in this new type of system? And um, it's hard to do, especially when the government doesn't want to cooperate. Uh, it just doesn't want to cooperate. Like one of the things that I use as an example where the executive and judicial branch disagree is I use an American example where the uh, 
in the 1830s, the uh, Cherokee used to live in Georgia and uh, the settlers there found gold and so they wanted to force the Cherokee out of Georgia and the Cherokee decided to take the settlers to court and they went all the way through the U.S. Uh, court system to the Supreme Court of the United States in the, in the, in the 1830s and they actually won before Chief Justice John Marshall. And that's when they say that Andrew Jackson, the president back then said, uh, so John Marshall made his decision, let us see him enforce it. And then he marched the Cherokee out of Georgia to Oklahoma. Thousands of them died, which became known as the Trail of Tears. But that's where the judicial branch and the executive branch get in a fight, and that does happen. And we do have Jacksonites here in Ontario, we have Jacksonites in BC, and we have Jacksonites in Canada that don't want to recognize our title and rights on the ground. And that's the struggle that we have. A lot of bureaucracies are, like all bureaucracies, a federal bureaucracy doesn't want to give up one square inch of power to the province, you know, nor to indigenous people. Same thing as the problems. They don't want to give up any square inch of power to the feds or to indigenous people. So it's a battle. So fighting this is really difficult. So one of the things we did last time in relationship to the Canada uh, United States trade war on softwood lumber, uh, I guess you kind of know that that's emerging its, its uh, head again in, in the economic forefront. Last time when that happened, uh, we wound up making a submission through the Natural Resources Defense Council in Washington, D.C. to the uh, United States Department of Commerce. And our argument before them was that Canada's policy of not recognizing Aboriginal and treaty rights on the ground was a subsidy to the Canadian forest industry. And that was accepted by the U.S. Department of Commerce. And when uh, Canada appealed those decisions to the World Trade Organization in Geneva, Switzerland, we made amicus curry submissions to the World Trade Organization in, uh, in Geneva. And we actually wound up making about five of them in the course of that period. And all of them were accepted by the World Trade Organization, which basically means that this thing called Aboriginal title does have a value to it. You know, despite the fact the Canadian government has a policy of not recognizing it, literally the policy of not recognizing it is a, 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 a international trade subsidy uh, policy, you know and that you can actually argue these things before the WTO. In fact, when, we, when Canada appealed to the bi-panel on the North American Free Trade Agreement last time around, um, they even had Canadians on the bi-panel, and uh, our submissions were, were also still accepted by them, because when you argue it, the original people have a proprietary interest in the, in the trees, in the minerals, and in the water, and these kinds of things. So the thing is that how does that intermingle with the crown, the crown's right, provincial crown land, federal crown land? How does Aboriginal title, which is a, which is a uh, <clears throat> recognized by the Supreme Court, as a proprietor or interest, how does that, how does that actually fit into, to, into that debate? That's what we're talking about here. Because I just got back from, from Washington, D.C. I just sure actually flew in from Washington, D.C., where I met with the uh, Natural Resources Defense Council, just to remind them of our last encounter way back in 1999, 2000, 2001, when we were dealing with the U.S. Department of Commerce talking to, uh, they actually have a Canada desk down there he headed by a, uh, Anthony Swift and, and also Liz Baird Brown, who's a lawyer who was working with us last time around, got into the meeting too to, to talk about, okay, how are we going to revive this thing? 
especially in view of the fact that this problem is, a ri is a rising again here in this country. And the more you put pressure and use economic leverage at this higher level, can you can start changing uh, domestic policy. I know last time around uh, <clears throat> when we uh, had our original submission accepted by the, the World Trade Organization, which was not uh, that easy to tell you the truth. Um, when we, uh, because we're, I, the Indigenous Network on Economies and Trade is not a state-run organization. We get no money from the Canadian government or the American government. We're, we're a group of indigenous people who work just as a network to promote Aboriginal tree rights uh, from an economic perspective. Because we have a lot of people who represent indigenous rights from a, from a traditional land use perspective, environmental perspective, uh, indigenous rights, human rights perspective, but very few that actually represent uh, the notion of Aboriginal rights as an economic uh, rights and so INET sort of basically does that that part of the work. So that's the the submissions. But we're not a state-run organization. So when we were actually talking to, to the World Trade Organization, trying to find out when we had to submit our submissions, um, they wouldn't tell us when we had to submit it. They said because we weren't a state government. And so they just wouldn't. So we had to guess. So we had to ask the United States when they had to make their submissions. And then when we figured out when they had to make their submissions, we just would submit our stuff two weeks in advance of what they had to submit their stuff in advance. So that's the only way you could figure it out. And they also told us that we had to fax our submission into the office in Geneva and uh, send hard copies to the primaries and to the, uh, sub uh, the subsidiary groups. And, um, but they said they wouldn't give us the fax number you know, because we weren't a state government. So we had to find out through other means what their fax number was so we could literally fax it. To the, because I mean, that's, the kind of um, things you have to get around to make a mission. So when I say we submitted it and then they accepted it, it that, was a, that was a big deal because it was the first indigenous submissions ever made uh, to the World Trade Organization. Because a lot of people write them off as totally losers and we don't like them and this kind of stuff. But the thing is that uh, there is some value to it because it did uh, give credibility to the fact that Aboriginal title has international proprietary consequences as a, as a value. And so that's important for, for to get that kind of endorsement. I know that after the submissions was accepted, I was invited by a group from NAFTA to go to a meeting in Mexico City and when I was at the meeting, they had people from NAFTA, from the WTO at the meeting. And they just said, uh, they wanted to ask me what we were doing in terms of uh, some of the research and stuff like that. But they said when they originally got the submission, they knew we had cultural rights and some rights to some environmental concerns and stuff like that. But they never realized that we had property rights. And that was the first time that the World Trade Organization recognized that indigenous people do have some underlying proprietary rights. That means that despite the fact that a timber is cut under provincial law by a non-native company and exported to uh, New York by a white company and sold in New York by a white company, it doesn't mean that indigenous people don't have a property right in every one of those two by fours that are sold in that process and we should be benefiting from that. I just say that because the, Nor the Nishnabiaski Nation actually was one of our treaty groups that was actually supporting those submissions when we made them back in the early 2000s. So it's important to understand that. And, they, and actually when we brought this issue up at Niagara Falls during the last Assembly of First Nations uh, meeting, we had uh, them um, um, 
the Anishinaabe Aski Nation supported our resolution that get passed by the AFN uh, nationally in, 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 in Canada. We also have uh, support from uh, the uh, North, uh, the, what they call the National Congress of American Indians out of uh, Washington, D.C. So we had support of American Indian tribes. And, uh, and I work with the uh, tribes from Colville, Yakima in the United States. And I just want to mention this about the United States. Um, they have a terrible history with indigenous people too. But they also have a very different relationship with relationship to these Indian reserve systems. And um, like Yakima Indian Reserve is over a million, about a million acres area. They are able to produce under the Yakima Forest um, Products Company about $33 million worth of timber products a year. And they've been doing that for years. Uh, they also access uh, U.S. state timber and stuff like that through, the, through their company. But the thing is, is that they're relatively quite independent than a Canadian reservation. And despite the fact that there are, like my reserve in B.C. is 7,000 acres. There's a big difference between 7,000 acres and 1 million acres. It's a hell of a lot of difference. And the thing is that the million acre reserve down in Yakima or Colville is like about a million acres too, is that those reserves are part of the Washington state economy. They're part of the United States economy. The fact that they're able to carry on a more independent livelihood because they have this larger land base is a positive plus for the American economy and not a drag down for the American economy. And that's the thing about the native communities in this country, they should be large enough, depending on the terrain, Northern Ontario will be different than British Columbia, and British Columbia will be different than the prairies, prairies will be different than the Maritimes, but through some sense of negotiations on these land issues that a land base should be sufficient to protect our language, protect our culture, you know, and provide some economic base for our community to be somewhat self-sufficient and be part of the more larger regional Canadian economy. Because we're not going to assimilate. We've, we, we've made that pretty clear. The residential school system tried to make us assimilate and we fought against that. We got an apology for it and we want to carry on. We still want to build and develop our own culture and it's important that we do that. So the thing is that we, we need to have a land base though. And we have to move from 0.2 to something that at least Canada won't be laughed at. Because when we raise 0.2 at the international level, international human rights people just sort of shake their head that they, Canada would be that ludicrous to think that we're gonna survive on that kind of land base, you know? So to have a land base large enough to sustain indigenous people is really the first question in the issue of self-determination. Because colonization, like I told you, is dispossession, dependency, and oppression. The international solution to colonization is self-determination. And self-determination is first to deal with the land base, then self-government, then economic development as, as a group of people. And it's important, Canada is, doesn't have a population problem. Globally, we have a population problem. Domestically, Canada doesn't. And we have to start figuring this out. But it has to be very creative because we do have a federal system. And, uh, but we have a country large enough we have a constitution with a framework that can allow this kind of development to happen, you know? And we have the legal process that agrees that something should happen along this line there. That's why they're recognizing title. But how does it unfold on the ground? That's the big question. And that's where legal scholars and legal uh, practitioners in this country really have a heavy responsibility because you're going to wind up playing a big hand 
in, in, in that struggle of reshaping and making a decolonized Canada, one that balances out indigenous rights and settler rights, you know? Because we need to put in, we need to put the colonial doctrines, even though Canada says that we don't apply them here in Canada, we need to put them in the garbage because despite the fact we say they don't apply, the concepts that they embody do apply. There's no question about it. And we need to put that in the garbage and we need to rebuild Canada based upon, based upon the human rights as defined under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, under the International Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights, especially in view of Article 1 on self-determination. Because self-determination does not just belong to the settlers. It also belongs to the indigenous people. And how do we balance out this right to self-determination under Article 1 between the settler and indigenous people? That's what we're working on trying to figure out here. There's no blueprint for it. You can, there's no place you can find a blueprint for it. We need to work it out. That's the problem. Indigenous people and non-indigenous people have to figure that out, but we have the territory, we have the land base, we have the constitutional framework, we got all the material that we actually really need in, in order to provide that kind of um, um, new Canada, you know? And that's the, the real problem uh, we have right now is a political problem of how do you move the political process to start developing the political will to start working in that direction because the courts have swung as much as they can, I think, in that direction. But it's how do you apply these things on the ground? And I think Canadians uh, can uh, support things like Indigenous people uh, in a lot of the, the struggles on the ground, because uh, even though it's going to require a lot of uh, confidence or a lot of trust on the part of non-native people, um, but one of the things I think is very clear is that some of these challenges uh, that are going to surface are in relationship to mining, uh, in, in whether or not mines in the province are going to be able to continue uh, with, um, with a free hand and opening mines that are going to really challenge the water capacities of, of BC. I know like that Imperial Metals, they just reopened that mine and they polluted a lot of areas with uh, minerals and other things. That's a problem. The other thing that's going to be seen is going to be a challenge is going to be the Kinder Morgan. The Sagopma people are planning a major meeting this coming spring to talk about it. I know a lot of our people have been to Standing Rock. I've been to Standing Rock. I'm actually going back to Standing Rock on, in early December uh, down there to show my support for those people. So the thing is that because we're concerned that Kinder Morgan goes down the Thompson River Valley, that they can poison all of the salmon in the, in the Thompson Fraser River system. And uh, we don't want to see that. They got one pipeline there. Why do we want to double that problem? So there are those issues. The same issue with the Gateway Pipeline was the same problem. Uh, there's a lot of issues that we as Indigenous people are challenging them because of our relationship to the land is, is much different. And economically, you should be aware that the non-natives look at the land as a resource base. You convert that resource base through some industrial activity, make two by fours or may mine out uh, minerals or whatever have you, but then they convert it ultimately into, uh, into um, uh, some kind of product that they sell, make money, make garbage, uh, this kind of thing. Native people look at the land in a different way. We look at the land in a circular way, and I know this 
Some of you may know this, some of you may not, but one of the things is we look at animals, plant life, water, you know, the land itself, uh, the air is all being equal. And that if we damage one of these things, it's going to come back and cause havoc with you sooner or later. So you need to be careful. Like with me, the tree is my brother. And uh, it's, it's there. he's not a tree to be made two by fours out of just because I want to make money. He's not that kind of thing. So there's a different conceptualization of values. And those values have to be, I think, part, more part of decision making here in uh, time. Huh? Okay. Yeah. The the yeah the the you know the the circular concept of, of of the economy. Those notions have to be reintroduced back into the equation here on a global basis, simply because of of climate change. You know, uh, climate is one of the more brutal. Uh, players in the game, when it decides it's going to get nasty with human beings, there's nothing we really can do to stop it, you know. And uh, if you keep on going uh, and ignoring the fact that human activity has a dramatic impact on the climate, we're going to be in serious trouble. And Canada has to really be careful in this because we are a big player in this because of the Alberta tar sands. You know, I, I flew over the Alberta tar sands with uh, James Cameron and those, and it was devastating looking out of the helicopters at, at the amount of destruction that's going on there. And Canada benefits from that money-wise, but we also uh, uh, cause problems for us environmentally down the road. There's no question about it. Kinder Morgan's part of that plan. That's the come I, I basically say there should be no pipelines, period, anymore. You know, we got the pipelines, live with the pipelines you got, but don't build anymore. That's as simple as that because the addiction to oil and gas problems has to stop and we have to start. Canadians have a big part to say on that, you know. Especially in view of the fact that we talked a bunch of very rich people to invest the kind of money that they did invest in the tar sands up to now. And we're trying to say, don't, you're not going to benefit from that at all, except using the existing pipelines. And that's the kind of things that we're saying. But those are serious questions that indigenous people uh, have a, a, a right to play in. And we do play those, those cards in the Kinder Morgan and the Gateway thing with the Uno student camp and all those things that are out there that actually have influenced decisions. Because we're the ones who, in the court of law, can actually talk about how we use cedar going back into the centuries and legally convince the Supreme Court of Canada to impose a consultation and accommodation in the Haida case. That's the, there's proof is in the pudding. Just read the evidence of these cases you study. Those are the things that we actually do raise. So these things are part of the equation that, that we talk about. So in trying to influence the economy in terms of externalities and stuff like that to include the fact that environment is part of the equation is something that, 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 that we need to push as, as indigenous people. So the thing is that you take it all away from the local, the historical concept, all the way through to the, the tragedies that we've experienced as indigenous people, to the point of trying to find a whole new solution through the legal and constitutional frameworks we've created, to also addressing some of the more broader questions of protecting the environment, of working with Canadians, of forming a stronger kind of economy. And I think for one thing, uh, you know, if we develop a strong economy, I think Indigenous people should be primarily responsible for the environment under Section 35.1.
of the Canadian Constitution, simply because we have a greater affinity to the food that we eat and to the uh, laws that need to apply and how they apply when they're talking about trees, you're talking about rivers, you're talking about fish, you're talking about forest products and, 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 and uh, our sustainability as a culture. So there's a lot of things tying us together as, as, uh, as Indigenous people and Canada. And I think it's, uh, it's at that time in history where we can uh, make change. Um, every day uh, in British Columbia, uh, band offices are flooded with all kinds of uh, inquiries and references about developments in their local regions called referrals. And I know that probably happens clean across this country. So there's a lot of work that uh, is right now uh, being um, uh, under that kind of scrutiny. It's really, where do we go from here though? What do we actually do? Anyways, that's my big question. Thank you. Are you talking about the subsidy stuff? Um, yeah, or like land or rights, Aboriginal rights and economic rights. Because I understand oh, the yeah. context in BC, mm. but in Ontario, where the Crown says land has been surrendered, uh, can those rights be seen as economic rights too? I, I sort of uh, argue, and we do this in our, in our submission, is that the underlying, there's an underlying title that remains indigenous. Uh, whether or not what does that really mean is, is, is the, the big question um, in areas where there are no, no treaties at all, you know, um, and where there is the surrender business, you know, the, obviously the government can argue that there's some differentiation, but I think uh, Aboriginal rights is an inalienable right. And if you take a look at the uh, submissions by the United Nations, um, that uh, talk about Aboriginal rights. They uh, actually tell Canada they cannot ask Indigenous people to extinguish their Aboriginal rights. And they have asked Canada what happens where the land rights have been extinguished? Are you going to ever open up the, the or to, to talk again, and they basically said, no, we won't. Which doesn't mean that we can't challenge them on that part. But if there's really not a lot of question about it, we, we take that there's an underlying title in that, which is connected to your human right to exist as a people with a language, with a culture, with an economy and so forth, that people can not ask you to forego that. Yeah, so we, I think that's an important thing to, 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 to make Canada accountable on their human rights record. And I know a lot of Canadians don't really realize that on Indigenous rights, Canada has a really bad record, you know, to the, on this issue. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. How would you, how would we go about identifying 
Well, I think one of the areas you can look at is national parks. Uh, literally, uh, there's 36 different climatic zones in, in Canada, and they're actually wanting to build national parks and basically in each one of those areas so that you can preserve and protect the ecological biodiversity that we depend on. And I think the same thing should be done generally with regard to indigenous people. Uh, I know a lot of our language and cultures associated with our association to the wild bees, the animals, and the plants, and everything. And literally, the language is an interdialogue of that ecological biodiversity of the region. And I think that uh, when I'm saying that, what, how would these things generally benefit everyone is that literally we have to come up with some kind of solution. But it is being done already in Canada. Like they want to do 10%, I think, in, in the national parks. And then their natives got 0 0.2, and the national parks and the grizzly bears got 10%. My God, you know, let's, you, you know, let's straighten this out. <laughs> but that's what you need to do is talk, let's say, 10% or 15% should go towards indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think indigenous people should use their, their their existing land base. Like for one thing, I I would say uh, that all Indian reserves are Aboriginal title lands, especially in view of Section 351, simply because it's indisputable that these people had control over that land base and still do. It's really, do you want to go and operate under the Indian Act, which is the colonial concept of the Indian, uh, the, of the um, colonial concept of the government as the master and the indigenous person as a servant concept, or do you want to start building a whole new self-government based on uh, Section 35 rights that you could be a reviving of some older rights, uh, but definitely. When you're talking about renewable energy and stuff like that, uh, you can start doing that under this if you start developing your own form of government, you know, like uh, where you start using your land uh, in a way that will set an example to other people, like how the, the land should be compatible with, with, with land. And I know there are some reserves that actually are, have been doing that, but we've had. Uh, sustainable or environmental uh, conferences with the Indigenous Environment Network and stuff like that. And there's some Indian bands that have actually showed up that actually are doing this stuff that you're talking about from BC. But I, and I did hear about some places in Ontario, but I, I didn't meet them at that time. But uh, no, I think it's something that we should be involved in. Mm -hmm. be able to not be, uh, to do things off reservation? Is that what you're talking about? 
I mean, in, uh, in the United States, off-reservation hunting and fishing is utilized through treaty rights. But in Canada, it looks like not, not only that the reservations are like pretty small compared to the uh, national demography, um, there is no right to hunt and fish and use, and use, and use other resources outside of reservations. I think in, in, in Canada, there are areas treaty rights to be able to hunt off the reservation. I think if it's not on private property and stuff like that, but I'm not really sure. But uh, I'm not really too familiar with uh, treaties per se, just because so, I'm not from a treaty area. But from overhearing discussions with treaty Indians, uh, they they do talk about being able to deal with and I think there are some cases like where they built a cabin or somewhere off reservation and they were allowed to do that. Uh, but you have to do more research in, in that area. Uh, in the United States, uh, they do have problems off reservation. That's what the Standing Rock issue is about. You know, like the uh, pipeline is going near the Standing Rock Reservation, but it's in their treaty area. There's no question about it. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you talked about being a point two chief right here. Um, I'm just wondering who or how do you decide who sits at the table in terms of negotiating um, the types of things that you're talking about? Uh, you have to, you have to uh, work that out nation by nation. There's no question about it. Uh, some nations, uh, have uh, a very traditional base system still in their in their uh, decision making uh, system. Like I, I just came from uh, Bella Coola and the New Hulk people, and uh, I was meeting with the traditional chiefs there, and uh, they all showed up at the meeting and they just wanted to be briefed about uh, the work that I've been doing and stuff like that. So I spent about two days with them, and uh, they. Uh, they pretty well have their system in place, and I told them that they need to be a, even more clear in their lawmaking powers and that. I said, because when you get out on the land, that's going to be your defense, is how your legal system operates and functions. In my traditional territory, uh, the Indian Act system uh, was accepted in the 1950s, and our traditional system basically is... Uh, not that well uh, preserved in, in the system. So you, you then have to assemble yourself and come up with some kind of decision-making authority uh, through this process. And that's what I'm doing with Kinder Morgan is I'm calling upon people to, to specifically meet on one topic and one topic only, and that's Kinder Morgan. So, so you have to generate, a, 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 I guess, an Aboriginal rights-based title holder kind of assembly yeah. yourself. One that has to be able to defend itself mm -hmm. uh, by saying we have this many people, we have made these decisions based on that, and if you don't like it, then we'll meet you at the barricades. You know, that kind of thing. Hmm. Each nation like bargains for its own uh, rights to regain more than point, like more land, with like each so that each reserve <coughs> expands itself. Or do you imagine there being some sort of collective bargaining unit, like and, and what that might look like? Would would the AFN be useful in that regard um, as a sort of collective bargaining tool to get more than point two for all Indigenous nations, or is it very individualized in your conceptualization of that, those good I think, uh, for one thing, generally, I think it's a bottom-up uh, kind of approach from the indigenous side. And I think from the government side, they have to be, um, they have to agree to uh, negotiate with, with the nation itself, as opposed to divide and rule. Uh, right now, uh, on the government side, 
they will negotiate under the BC treaty process with actually just one or two bands. In our case, as Club Indian Nation, they will negotiate with four bands out of 17. You know what I mean? And we've gotten uh, rulings from the United Nations uh, human rights body that that's wrong. That they shouldn't be doing that. They should be dealing with the entire nation. And the government can actually force that, the nations to get together uh, even if they they don't want to, uh, by just saying we'll just negotiate with all of you or not not negotiate at all. That's as simple as that. And uh, so the thing is that, and I think it's important for each of the nations to realize that uh, what we're really looking at is to a land base where we can uh, sustain our culture, language, and other things. So there has to be some contiguous kind of probably togetherness of this area so it wouldn't necessarily be like the 17 each one increased by so much i i wouldn't see that as, as, as necessarily functioning because those communities that are out there normally were either a summer dwelling area or a winter dwelling area and uh, the people that were setting them up didn't really realize that you know and we've been sort of imposed on staying in them but uh, if we want to build a, a more sustainable one, we should be talking about probably collectively looking after that. And a lot of our younger people can, can move into those areas. Like my area, for instance, uh, there's really no room for expansion. Like half of our reserve is living in Vancouver, you know, and that's the same with most reserves. 50% of all the Indian people live in ur local urban areas. It's just, there's just no room on the existing reservation for them. So that's where these newer communities would actually be a, a place where those people would be able to congregate and build their own economy that way. Colonial project is both economic and racist in its interest, right? Um, so, to what extent is it important to unpack that relationship for people to understand? Um, you know, the the the, the, the use of criminal law, the repression, um, marginalization of Indigenous people on the one hand, um, and the the uh, not at all unrelated occupation and, and pillage of lands and resources that's enabled by marginalizing the people. Because um, I think it, it helps, and maybe that's maybe, it, maybe part of my thinking here is that if this is a room full of law students, that's a good thing to, to look at um, in terms of how those structures are, are imposed and what can be done to unpack them together and separately. Um, and, and likewise, uh, one of my favorite art manual quotes is uh, about how every time I talk, every time I try to talk to the government about the land and collective rights, I end up talking to the RCMP. <laughs> <laughs> um, and again, it comes back to criminalization, but also the, the uh, uh, kind of the objectification um, of of those struggles, so that they're they're not they're not about the issues. They're not about the land. They're about court injunctions and who has the right to apply to the court for something or, or another. So you're not just you know you never get to talk to the crown about the crown's interests. You only talk to the crown about whether you're breaking the rules um, that they created. So and again, I, I I haven't figured out how to unpack that, but I but I think. I think part of the answer is is always in more education and understanding among the white population of what the reality is and how much those economic interests are not ours. I mean, you know, Murray Edwards' interests in, in Imperial Rebels have nothing to do with the community or the steelworkers union or anybody else. 
Um, but they, they managed to play that together as if it's in the public interest for this mine to reopen and keep moving, right? Um, so you know, the more that can be broken down, I think, I think the better off we might be, right? I don't want to be as often as I think uh, when I get into this concept of throwing the whole colonial doctrines of discovery in the garbage is I'm talking about what you're talking about because really the <coughs> colonial doctrines of discovery as a concept is really in gay, is really part of the uh, what do you call injunction and enforcement order process that the either industry or government uses against indigenous people who are maybe blocking a road where they don't want logging to happen or they're drawing attention to imperial metals, you know, dumping um, all that uh, mercury in, uh, into the Quesnel uh, Fraser River water system. And uh, that's where they, they just say, we have the right as the crown to uh, this land and you're trying to either um, trespass or you're creating mischief or doing something and we're going to impose this injunction on you and get you get you out of there and um, nine times out of ten we lose you know like when we we're doing that at Sun Peaks I remember I phoned Louise Mandel and asked her uh, that we were, had this injunction to deal with and she said oh I can't go because I'm busy I'm doing something else she said, well, why don't you just go yourselves? You know, the, the, it's a 99% chance I'll lose. <laughs> if you go and you lose, you're no further ahead. <laughs> you still got your money. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, we, we went and defended ourselves and we did lose. But, <laughs> but definitely it's one of those things where, uh, where if the government was to change its position, it would uh, it would change uh, how governments institute uh, injunction in that. I know in one case in Sun Peaks, uh, when Irene Billy, who was an elder, she's passed away since then, um, was there and Lynn Smith was the judge. She didn't want to send this elder to jail for a, uh, uh, what do you call contempt of court for not leaving an area and um, she just latched onto the idea that the uh, uh, Sun Peaks and the RCMP used a handwritten map as a uh, place where she was said she was and that that handwritten map was not sufficient for her to say that she was in a place where she shouldn't have been and therefore she wouldn't she dismissed it which is really hard. I don't know. You guys know this. Uh, judges really, um, they, you know, any contempt of their court, they really get pissed off. Eh? <laughs> they, don't, they don't like letting you go. In this case, they wanted to let her go. There's no question about it. And so she made the, uh, blamed it on the RCMP and on Sun Peaks. They said, you guys have enough money to hire a real engineer to come up and really survey where this woman was, and you guys didn't do it, therefore it's gone. I'm not going to put this woman in jail. She's out of here. And so it was just uh, that quickly. But you would see where uh, the uh, government pushes the court into a position where they don't really want to be either. They don't want to be used as the heavy hand of government when government doesn't want to come across with a decent policy. Len Smith didn't feel like she wanted to be the, the, the straw to beat down the end. She said, no, I'm not going to hear you guys, you fix the policy. And so the next time when our people were arrested, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the police dropped the charges and then I said in the news that maybe they were coming to their senses and they got mad and they had called a meeting and they said no. <laughs> It's just that the arrest was done so badly that if we went to court, they would throw it out. So even they were sensing that you only can push this injunction thing so far in a society where the system is thinking they don't want to go down that route. So that's how you generally uh, can put pressure on them, educate the public that the real underlying problem is the lack of a policy to deal with the land base. 
That's what the big problem is. And don't try to throw it all on the injunction system. It's not the mechanism to do this job, you know. Maybe this will be our last question because we're running to the end of our time. Go ahead. Not, I mean, not all the things, but one thing in particular in that is that 35 could potentially be used to make the environment the jurisdiction of indigenous peoples in the country. So opening up the constitutional order. And so is that, does that take the shape, I guess I'm wondering what shape that takes. Does it take the shape of writing into 35 uh, the environment, or does it take the shape of opening up 91, 92, 93 to redistribute the powers? Does it, I, I guess it, it's a compelling notion, and I wonder what it looks like in the Constitution. Well, one of the things that um, I, I always get in the, in the back of my mind is that when the Constitution was uh, patriated, it was like uh, 35 and 37 or something, and uh, 35 one. I think the 37 was the conferences, uh, and it called for constitutional conference, and they, Canada did have four uh, constitutional, con and there were failures, eh? And uh, there were failures simply because the province didn't want, and the provinces and the feds didn't want to give up one inch of power, and that's why they failed. And they felt that they could do that simply because they could turn it over to the Supreme Court of Canada to decide what, are, what 35 really means, and that's where it is really right now. But one of the questions that, that I'm raising at the international level is that what England really wanted when they put that in was that they wanted an agreement to be made between the government and First Nations people after the fourth meeting of that conference. And because that meeting never did happen, we still need that. And then what does that mean internationally? This is what my argument is. What it means is that when it failed, instead of being demoted or transferred over to the, the judicial branch of Canada, which can't address issues of self-determination because they're bound into the existing federal system, uh, that instead of going that way, the decision went up to the United Nations Human Rights Committee that's responsible for the implementation of the uh, Article One of the uh, Covenant on, you know, um, civil and political rights. So that's where I'm arguing is that that's where we we should force that issue, Article One. And it's really, if you if you read the decisions from those Human Rights Committee, you'll find that they have asked Canada specifically. How are you applying Article 1 to Indigenous people inside Canada? And Canada always argues by, I think, Article 27 or something, oh, we're dealing with them as a national minority, which is not the same as Article 1. Article 1 embodies title and right to land. Article 1 just deals with uh, religion, uh, linguistic, cultural rights, that's all the so that's a minority within the Canadian framework. So the thing is they're actually two different things. So we got a lot of argument. And I think if the native people were a little wiser back in 19, uh, when they were doing the conferences, they would erase that. And I would have put pressure on the feds in the province to do something. Yeah, but the, the, and so I think that's the direction I'm going on that issue and always. Okay, well. everybody for coming and engaging so much in the questions. Certainly lots of ideas for us to move forward with.